the presentation of anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation economic social political and spiritual of the human race the emancipation Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. A Purity of Rebellion Anarchism, Animals, and More Than Human Worlds by Richard White. Some years ago, spending time in a second-hand bookstore, I remember flicking through the pages of a book I'd chanced upon. The opening to its introduction made a particularly deep and lasting impression. It read, Anarchism is the purity of rebellion. A pig who struggles widely and rends the air with his cries while he is helped to be slaughtered, and a baby who kicks and screams when, wanting warmth in his mother's breast, he is made to wait in the cold. These are two samples of natural rebellion. Natural rebellion always inspires either deep sympathy and identification with the rebelling creature, or a stiffening of the heart and an activation of aggressive defensive mechanisms to silence an accusing truth. This truth is that each living being is an end in itself, that nothing gives a being the right to make another a mere instrument of their purposes. The rebel against authority holds to this truth everything that concerns him and recognises no other judge than themselves. The book Social Anarchism was written by the Italian anarchist Giovanni Baldelli and published in 1971. What I hope to draw attention to in this short essay are some of the ways that anarchists have recognised and are recognising that the challenge of imagining, envisioning and enacting freedom and liberation has to transgress species boundaries. Indeed, rather than view the plight of other animals and beings as merely an afterthought or secondary concern of anarchist praxis, it becomes imperative that we understand how geographies of violence, hierarchies and oppressions are bound up with other animals and more than human worlds. Our futures are intimately and inextricably, in ways we are beginning only just to comprehend, bound to theirs. To talk or speak about this seems relatively straightforward, but it demands that we cast off centuries of inherited societal values and norms, including the myopic and violent world views that result from human supremacism, speciesism and anthroparchy, that have been handed down at such a heavy cost to ourselves, to others, and have brought devastating consequences to the world in which we live. Unfortunately, there are many examples that could have been used to illustrate this talk that speak to what Pedersen and Sonescu call the animal condition, namely, the actual life situation of most non-human animals in human society and culture, as physically and emotionally experienced with its routine repertoire of violence, deprivation, desperation, agony, apathy, suffering and death. But I've chosen to foreground the relationships between humans and farmed animals for three reasons. The first is the sheer scale of suffering that this relationship involves, and suffering which extends far beyond the bodies of the farmed animals themselves. The second is because this helps re-articulate and reanimate a call for vegan praxis to take root and flourish. Not only is this a logical and rational position to take, but it can also help us think in ever more complex ways about other relationships we have with food, say, and more than human worlds. Appealing to the writings of anarchists, it is clear that there are many tremendous possibilities that emerge once we embrace more than human communities, in ways that not only encourage us to recognise ourselves as fellow beings, but how we can learn so much more about ourselves and our relationships to each other and to the earth by looking to these communities for guidance, wisdom and understanding. Indeed, we might also consider it essential that we do so urgently if we are to harness anarchist praxis in ways that might yet help prevent the world as we know it from being fundamentally, irrevocably altered. 
It's important to mention that there are powerful interventions that speak to vegan anarchism or anarcho-veganism that are already out there, not least in the 1997 pamphlet written by Brian Dominic. However, as a vegan anarchist geographer, I want to shed further light on what anarchist geographies may offer at the present moment, and perhaps invite the listener to engage more fully in this field moving forward. Before continuing, I want to suggest that veganism, like anarchism, is one of the most willfully misunderstood and misrepresented terms within mainstream society, and indeed in radical circles that one could imagine. While vegans, like anarchists, conceptualise this perhaps more through appealing to a spirit or an attitude, something that escapes being neatly defined, for the context of the podcast, I'll draw on a well-known and influential definition. While veganism, like anarchism, has a far richer and greater history that predates the time in which it was formally introduced and popularised, vegan was coined by Donald Watson and his future wife Dorothy in 1944 in the UK city of Leicester. For them, veganism represents a philosophy and way of living which seeks to exclude, as far as is possible and practicable, all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing and any other purpose, and by extension promotes the development and use of animal-free alternatives for the benefit of humans, animals and the environment. There are just three key points that I wish to emphasise in this reading. Firstly, veganism speaks of a praxis of theory and action. Secondly, it is not dogmatic, suggested by its interpretation as being as far as is possible and practicable, And this necessitates an ongoing and unfolding commitment to interspecies questions of social and spatial justice. And thirdly, veganism is never just about the excluding um, of cruelty based on the choice of food. Conceived at a time of immense suffering and tragedy as the Second World War unfolded across Europe, veganism affirmed its call for freedom and liberation through a radical commitment to non-violence and a respect for all life. Part 1. Farmed Animals In 2023 we continue to wage a war on animals. It is conservatively estimated that at least 70 billion land animals are killed for their body parts to be consumed as food every year. For water-based animals their deaths undoubtedly stretch into the hundreds of billions. Such figures are incomprehensible as is the extreme suffering and untold violence that these sentient beings, these farmed animals, will face while alive, and which will ultimately result in their untimely and brutal deaths. I mean to encourage us to think about the ways in which anarchists have appealed to why this matters by means of two illustrations, the second one perhaps less obvious than the first. A great influence on my own thinking here comes directly from the writings of the French anarchist geographer Elise Reclus. In particular, in his searing essay on vegetarianism, published in 1901, Reclus spoke of a loss of boyhood innocence and of shadows cast over his childish years caused by his encounters with the kind-hearted village butcher and the bloody carcasses that trickled blood in that butcher's yard. Two of the strongest impressions he reflected upon involved the forcible killing of a pig that an elderly woman had befriended and in bearing witness to amateur butchers bleeding another pig slowly to make black puddings. Echoing the spirit of Baldelli's introduction to social anarchism of this latter encounter, Reclus wrote, She cried without ceasing, now and then uttering groans and sounds of despair almost human, it seemed like listening to a child. Linking the human consequences of treating other animals that otherwise love as we do, feel as we do, and under our influence, progress or retrogress as we do. The clue goes on to juxtapose the horrors of war, quote, with the massacre of cattle and carnivorous banquets. Is there, he asks, so much difference between the dead body of a bullock and that of a man? We are one lesson. In concluding, Reclue entreats us to listen to and understand and trust our own reactions to the routine, everyday repertoires of violence and suffering that animates the animal plight. 
It is because of the ugliness of the deed which fills us with disgust, he writes. Ugliness in persons, in actions, in life and in the natural environment are all the enemy par excellence. Let us be beautiful, become beautiful ourselves and let our life be beautiful. The second illustration comes from the radical recognition that humans are also animals. It's interesting to be mindful of Emma Goldman's words that open the podcast, <clears throat> namely the presentation of anarchism as the social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political and spiritual of the human race. If this is to be taken seriously, then we anarchists must recognise the human animals that are always present in the spaces and sites of extreme violence and suffering that other animals, and in this context farmed animals, experience. Have you ever thought of who gets to work in the factory farms? Or who gets to experience the killing floor of the slaughterhouses first hand? These questions reveal uncomfortable and unsettling truths. It should come as no surprise to learn that slaughterhouse workers are drawn from the most marginalised and disenfranchised populations. Physically, the nature of the work leads to some of the highest level of occupation-related related injuries and also the most serious. Even if we suspend reality for a moment and imagine that such working conditions could be tackled in ways that drastically reduce these injuries, this will fail to begin to address the ever-expanding evidence base that documents the chronical, psychological and emotional impacts that are intrinsic to the act of killing other animals. Workers have consistently reported post-traumatic stress syndromes, their experiences have led to high rates of depression, anxiety, psychosis and feelings of lower self-worth. The coping strategies that are drawn on inevitably have seriously negative impacts that resonate across family and local communities alike. Some examples include increased alcohol and drug dependency, higher crime rates and higher instances of domestic violence. It is in recognising these realities and the implications that flow from them that have repeatedly inspired anarchists to take a broad range of direct and prefigurative actions here and should inspire more to do so, I would humbly suggest. Calls to embrace veganism as part of a broader transspecies liberatory praxis a t politics of total liberation, perhaps, certainly stand as one key example of this. Many animal liberationists have also impl implicitly and explicitly drawn on anarchist values in terms of organising in ways to look to close down the animal abuse industries. Here we might think of a broad spectrum of activism that includes the animal liberation front on one side and the outreach work focused on by Food Not Bombs on the other. Part 2. The Plight of Insects and More Than Human Worlds Truly caring for the plight of animals, humans included, opens oneself up to the ever-expanding horizons of awareness and new, of us, new understandings. In this context of farmed animals, we should also ask more searching questions of human dominance over others in our agricultural systems. This in turn sharpens our attention towards appreciating the lived experiences of other life forms, not least insects. For a contemporary society that has normalised violence to such an extent that any call to end the war on animals, to do no harm to other beings on the grounds of sentience, is seen as an extreme position to take, then the invitation to take seriously an ethics of care that does not appeal predominantly on sentient grounds is likely to be so offensive and outrageous as to result in spontaneous combustion. But we can see a selection of anarchist, vegan geographers, among others, pushing further beyond traditional appeals to sentience or consciousness at this moment in time. This cannot, consume, con, this cannot come soon enough. The rapid decline and collapse of insect populations is being reported on with increasing alarm. Figures have suggested that bees, ants and butterflies may be among the 40% of world species that will become extinct in a few decades. An apocalyptic scenario that would bring catastrophic implications for life on this planet. What role will anarchists play in helping to address and avert this imminent crisis? Of course, some anarchists have already entreated humans to pay closer attention to the insects' worlds, not only through necessity, but for the wonderful opportunities in which we might yet learn from and with them. The more obvious example comes through Peter Kropotkin, 
and his reference to invertebrates, to ants and bees, published in his magnus opus Mutual Aid. Here, the communities of termites, ants and bees were drawn on as another important means to illustrate and celebrate the admirable geographies of Mutual Aid. At this point, I'm also minded of the anarchist poet Louise uh, Bevington, in particular, her understanding that anarchy means a life for man and logos to the life of bees, beavers, ants and other gregarious creatures who have not only all natural resources but also one another's products freely and peacefully open to them and who do but cooperate the more perfectly and happily in securing the common interests of all for the fact that they are free. And if we can think meaningfully and deliberately about the commonalities and codependencies between ourselves, other animals and more than human worlds, then we should recognise that anarchism does not end there. Rather, our awareness should expand even further, not least to the soil herself and the life that is nurtured and sustained within. Are you aware that it takes about a thousand years to generate just three centimetres of fertile topsoil? Did you know that if the current rates of soil degradation are allowed to continue, then within three score years that fertile soil may be lost? As an allotment holder, I'm deeply immersed in those shared, overlooked yet always radical spaces that the anarchist Colin Ward fondly spoke of. Places that, in his words, allow us through everyday actions and practices to bring us closer to the earth and allow us to make our own geography. Certainly the act of growing my own fruit and vegetables has opened up an awareness of the wonder of soil and the mutual aid that is fostered within it. Recognising this, I practice a veganic no-dig approach so as to cause minimal disturbance to the life and the relationships that form underground. In terms of mutual aid, we now know that about 90% of land plants rely on mycorrhizal fungi, especially for mineral nutrients. In return, the fungus receives beneficial nutrients formed by the plant. Readers of Kropotkin might recall his prophetic words, Mutual aid is met with even amidst the lowest animals, and we must be prepared to learn some day from the students of microscopical pond life facts of unconscious mutual support, even from the life of microorganisms. And of course, a deeper appreciation for the soil beneath our feet and the life it brings into being should also cause us a profound humbleness and gratitude. As the anarchist geographer Simon Springer in his wonderful essay, I, Dirty Anarchist, observed, we place ourselves within the world, content to dwell in the complexity of its spectacular messiness, rooted firmly in the clay, the loam, the dirt. There is no clean separation for humanity, only a thick morass of endless entanglements. At the deepest level of imminence, we are inescapable from the soil, for we all inevitably return to it. Conclusion In Women, Destruction and the Avant-Garde, a Paradigm for Animal Liberation, Kim Sosha argued that proper contemplation of anarchist traditions leads to concern for animals. She followed this statement by asking, Can a society whose abiding objective is freedom from violence hierarchy and oppression, confine, slaughter, dominate, eat and wear other creatures. I hope that my arguments here have worked collectively to sketch out a firm, coherent and robust no in the face of this question. At the present moment it is essential that we anarchists open ourselves in ways that we can reject the violent world views we have laboured under more fully. A key means to this end is to be inspired and guided by the words and actions that anarchists have brought into this world, that speak to the kindred nature of ourselves, other beings and uh, more than human worlds. As part of this, hopefully, we can also find our own forms of thinking and ways of doing that can make a profound difference to help those who rebel against authority and domination in all its forms, and in doing so, we can continue to help society embrace and embody the profound freedom and liberation that we as anarchists, as anarchists becoming beautiful, yearn for. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.